Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 2. We will be reading verses 17 to 24. Romans chapter 2, verses 17 to 24. And um, Poppy's not going to like this, but I'm going to have you stand as we read the word together. <laughs> the barn cat is all wound up with Chris and doesn't want her to stand up. Oh my, oh my goodness. God. <laughs> and I say wound up, Don't I mean wound up. up. Gonna... <laughs> He's ready. I'm going to hang it. He's ready to stand up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 24. But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of truth, you therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one shall not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, through your breaking the law, you dishonor God, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. Let's pray. Father, we commit this time to you. We commit our hearts and our minds to you. We ask that you, uh, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would illuminate us, Lord, and illuminate your word to our hearts, and that... Um, we would know you better and that we would be able to walk with you more closely and be your servants more effectively because of your word this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Where words and deeds part ways. Where words and deeds part ways. That's what we're going to be talking about this morning. But as we begin to jump into this passage, I uh, just want to reiterate a few things. One is that, remember last week uh, the sermon was, uh, with God there's no partiality. There's no... There's no respecter of persons. When God looks at us, he doesn't look on the surface. He goes to the heart, and he looks at the heart. Um, when, in, in God's perspective and in God's eyes, there's only two kinds of people. You're either one or you're the other. In the eyes of the world, especially in our present day and age, there's 100,000 different kinds of people, and everybody has to identify with a certain kind of person. There's, There's all different kinds of colors, all different kinds of genders, all different kinds of everything. But in God's eyes, there's only two different kinds of people. In this section in, in the book of Romans, in chapters 1 and 2, he identifies it this way, the Jews and the Gentiles, or the Jews and the Greeks. But really what he's identifying is the people of God and those who are not the people of God. Those are the only two types of people in the world in God's eyes. Those who are His and those who are not His. Because remember, He doesn't look at anything on the surface. He's looking at the heart. So what that means is there's those whose hearts are for Him and those whose hearts are shut off from Him. So those are the only two kinds of people. Now in this section here, Paul is talking to those who identify themselves as those who are God's people those who think of themselves as God's people. And the reason, and they're called Jews here, because that's historically who are identified as God's people. And the reason that they feel that they're God's people because God handed his word to them and 
and entrusted his word to them and gave them the privilege and the task of spreading that word. So in a very real sense, as we sit here reading it today and studying it today, that's us as well. We are God's people. And we are entrusted with his word. Now we have the New Testament. And we are entrusted and, and um, commissioned to spread his word as God's people to those who are not his people so that they might have the opportunity to become his people. So, in verse 17, when he begins this little section that we've read through, he identifies who he's talking to, to. If you bear the name Jew, and my Bible has that in quotation marks, Jew, and rely upon the law and boast in God. So he's really talking to those who identify themselves as the people of God. Who've been entrusted with the scripture, who rely on the law, and who boast in God, and he goes on to say, and who know his will and approve the things that are essential because you've been instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, <clears throat> a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of foolishness, and as we're reading this, and as those who are listening were hearing it read to them or reading it themselves, in their minds now, they're probably going, hmm, he's getting a little sarcastic here. And that's what Paul is doing. He's getting a little bit sarcastic. He's saying, you call yourself God's people. You rely on the law and you boast in God. You know his will. You approve the things that are essential, instructed in the law. And you are confident that you are yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. You correct the foolishness. You teach the immature because you have the law, the embodiment of knowledge and, tr and of truth. And he is being very, hmm, yeah, you think you're all that, but let me tell you what you really are. And then he goes into what they really are in verses 21 through 24. This is what you really are. You're teaching everyone else, verse 21, but you're not teaching yourself. You're not paying attention to what you're teaching others. You're preaching, don't steal, but you're stealing. Just an example of how they were stealing and what Paul was referring to, Jesus talks about it in the Gospels, when he's paying attention to all the people that are bringing in their money to the temple. And he says, you guys have made up all kinds of, in today's language, we call them, um, when we're doing our taxes, tax write-offs, or tax shelters, or... Um, what do we do when people get mad at the rich because they got all these ways to hide their, hide their money? He says, this is what you're doing. All of your wealth, all of the wealth that you're living on, all of the wealth that you have, you are designating your wealth, and there's a word that they use as korban, meaning all that I have is dedicated to God. I mean, it's all dedicated to God. So, I'm just saying it's all God's, but I'm keeping it for myself. So you put it into this tax bracket of this is dedicated to God, yet you still use it only for yourself, and you're not giving to the poor, you're not giving to the priests, you're not giving to the temple needs, you're keeping it for yourself because you put it into that bracket. You're robbing God. You're robbing his people. Because you have twisted his word, and you've twisted his intent, so that you can keep it all for yourself. That's just one example of how they are stealing. <clears throat> you teach another, you preach. Verse uh, Chapter 22, you say, don't commit adultery. Are you committing adultery? What did Jesus say in the Gospels again? He says, let me tell you. If you look at a woman, if you look at a woman and lust, 
you've committed adultery in your heart. And that's where God's looking. He's looking in the heart. Everyone else is looking on the surface. Oh, that's such an upright, righteous man or upright, righteous woman. That's what you see. But God's looking at the heart and he sees adultery in your heart. You've committed adultery before God if you're looking at someone else and lusting after them. So you who say, verse 22, you should not commit adultery, you're committing adultery. You who abhor idols, yet you're robbing temples. And then look at verse 23. You who boast in the law, through your breaking the law, you dishonor God. So he's got three things against them. You boast in the law, yet you break the law, and you dishonor God. Boasting in the law. That word boasting is from the root word for neck. This thing right here. In other words, it's the thing that holds your head up high. It's the thing from which you can look down on other things from this elevated position. It means to exult in something, to be proud of something, to look at things from this elevated vantage point. Ooh, look at me, I'm way up here, I'm looking down on everybody else. You're boasting. The verb form of this word everywhere in the Greek in the, in the New Testament is always in what's called the middle voice, meaning that this look that you're gazing out with at everything, you're looking at it as if you have a personal interest in it. This is something that you're gaining, uh, you're gaining something from this boasting, this thing that you're boasting in. I'm getting something. This is why it's always in the middle voice. I'm, I'm seeing something for myself in what I'm boasting in. Now, there's good boasting and there's not good boasting. And in the Bible, that word is used 38 times. Here's some good things to boast in. 2 Corinthians 10, 17. He who boasts is to boast in the Lord. Boasting in the Lord, that's okay. Romans 5, verses 2 and 3. We boast in our hope. We boast in our tribulation. What a crazy thing to boast in. We boast in our troubles. Yeah, if you, if you have your, your head on right, from that elevated position of the knowledge of the Word of God, you know that tribulation works. Patience, patience, experience, experience, hope. And all the tribulations and trials that we have, they develop endurance in us. So we, we can boast in that. Those are good things to boast in. Things that are not good to boast in. 1 Corinthians 3.21 Other people. Boasting in our idols of this world, really. Another thing to not boast in, 2 Corinthians 11, 18. The flesh. Stop boasting in your flesh. And let's turn in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I want you to read this. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, in verses 1 through 7. Another thing, or things, to not boast in. And this is where all of us fall sometimes. Some of us fall all the time in this regard. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 7. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Now when Paul introduced this letter at the beginning, he identified the fact that that was a church divided. And some of the people in that church says, well, I follow Paul. Some said, I follow Apollos. Some said, I follow Peter. Others go, well, I follow Jesus, so I'm better than all y'all. And they were all divided, though. They were all taking pride in and boasting in the ones they were following. So Paul is addressing that. He says... In verse 2, in this case, moreover, it's required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. So here we are, Paul says, we are servants of Christ. Verse look, at, uh, look at verse 21 of the, next, uh, the previous chapter, chapter 3. Look at chapter 3, verse 21. Let no one boast in men. For all things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, that's Peter. 
or the world or life or death, all things present or things to come, all things belong to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. So look at us, verse 4, Paul and Apollos and Peter as servants of Christ and we are stewards. We're just stewards of the mysteries of God. And in this case, it's required that we, the stewards, those who are given the task of shepherding you be found trustworthy. Verse 3, but to me it's a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even examine myself, Paul says. Get your eyes off of me. Get your eyes off of Apollos. Get your eyes off of Cephas. Get your eyes off of us. I don't even have my eyes on us. I am conscious, verse 4, of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. The one who examines me is the Lord and him, him alone. He's the only one that's qualified to examine me. Therefore, verse 5, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring light to things hidden in the darkness and, dis and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. And you recall, we've talked about this before, there is a judgment that's coming for those who are the people of God. It's called the judgment seat of Christ where he does expose the hearts, the motives of our hearts. And you remember it talks about the, the things that we've done in this world will pass through fire. And anything that was done out of selfishness or selfish ambition, even if it was the best of things in the view of this world, it's going to perish as if by fire. But anything that was done out of humility and, and in, in a spirit of humbly serving Christ, and all the investments that we did, particularly in each other, as humble servants of Christ, will come out as pure gold, silver, and precious jewels. The things of the heart are going to be exposed at that time. Verse 6, chapter 4. Now these things, brethren, I figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sake, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that no one of you will become arrogant on behalf of one against the other. In other words, I'm telling you this because you're all boasting about one or the other and who you're affiliated with. you got to stop that. Verse 7, for who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? In other words, do not boast in self-accomplishments in those things that you've done or things that other people have done. It doesn't matter. Everything that's been done that is of value and lasting value in the world is from Him. So continue to boast in Him. Don't boast in Paul. Don't boast in Apollos. Don't boast in Cephas. Don't boast in the preacher. Don't boast in the teacher. Boast in the Lord because it all comes from Him and all the results are due directly from Him. So, boasting. You, verse 23 of Romans again, if you want to turn back there. You who boast in the law are breaking the law, which means to deviate or overstep or go contrary to the law. You're boasting in the very thing that you're breaking. You're not keeping the law. And because of that, dishonor happens. Dishonor happens, meaning... you. Those who, who watch you begin to despise someone. They begin to treat someone disgracefully. They treat as if God has no value. They look at us, and if we are, if our words are not matching up with our deeds, and our deeds are self-oriented and selfish, people will look at us and they'll despise God. They will dishonor God. They will treat God as if he has no value when they see us acting as if he has no value. The result of that is verse 24. When people see the people of God boasting in God, boasting in their knowledge of God, boasting in all the things that they're doing for God, and yet at the same time being false about what they're doing with God, because it's for selfish motives or a selfish agenda or, or all of those kind of things. When that happens, verse 24, the name of God is blasphemed among those who are not the people of God. 
because of us, because of you, he says, just as it's written. What does that mean? The name of God is blasphemed. What does blaspheme mean? We all have different ideas in our mind. Literally means <clears throat> to slow down and to try to cut off someone's reputation. Literally, it's made up of two words, slow and reputation. To just put the brakes on someone who's trying to esteem someone else. Blaspheme. It's related to gossip. It's related to, to uh, mocking. It's related to cursing. It's related to all those words, but it's a real specific word. It means to refuse to give someone their due. It means to be slow in acknowledging someone's honor or reputation. He's not worth my, he's not worth it. What does blasphemy look like? If you turn, you don't have to turn there. We'll, we'll just tell this one. We'll turn to another passage later. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 3, Jesus is in somebody's house. And it's so crowded that nobody can get in. And so these friends of a man who is paralyzed climb up on the roof and start pulling the tile off. And they make a hole big enough. And they start to lower the man down through the roof into the house so that Jesus can have a moment with this man. Because Jesus is healing everybody. And his friends really desperately want this friend of theirs healed. So they lower him on this, on this mat in front of Jesus. And the crowd's looking on and it's filled with teachers of the law, Pharisees. They're all in there. They're all crowding around. And Jesus looks at him and he says, Son, this is the first thing he says. He doesn't say, you're healed. He says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Because Jesus was looking at the heart, wasn't he? He already knew that that man was looking at Jesus as, you're my Lord, you're my master, I'm submitting to you. He knew that, and he said, your sins are forgiven. And the teachers of the law were horrified. They were horrified. Because here was a man, here was a man who was ascribing to himself something that is due God. They didn't think that Jesus... Was God Almighty yet they didn't want to think that so they said who is this man that's blaspheming God because in their minds he was taking on the attributes of God for himself so that was blasphemy to take upon yourself what is due God well of course just to put a final period on that story Jesus looks at them he knows what they're thinking he knows what they're muttering about he says so which one of these is harder for me to say? To say your sins are forgiven or get up, take your mat, go home. He's been paralyzed for almost his entire life. But so that you might know that I am the son of God, get up, take your mat, go home. And the guy got up, rolled up his mat and walked out. And they all knew he had never walked before. So. Jesus did prove that he did have the right to say, son, your sins are forgiven. So blasphemy looks like taking upon oneself something that is due only God. And the teachers of the law knew that. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 38 to 44, Jesus is hanging on the cross and there's three different groups that are hurling blasphemous statements at Jesus while he's hanging on the cross. You had just the crowd, the rabble of the crowd, they're hurling insults, they are hurling abuse, they're insulting him, they're mocking him, they're scorning him, and the umbrella word over, over all of that is they're blaspheming him. You have the soldiers and the religious leaders of the Jews blaspheming Jesus, and you have the two thieves, one on either side, blaspheming Jesus. Hurling insults, hurling abuse, hurling mockery and scorn at Jesus on the cross. And of course, we know that the other, the, the one thief repented, called Jesus his Lord, and was with Jesus in paradise that very day. Turn to, no, don't turn there. Acts chapter 26, verses 9 through 11. Paul 
is sharing his personal testimony with one of the magistrates because he is on his way to Rome to go to trial before Caesar, but he's sharing his personal testimony and he says this, I formerly used to drag men, women, and children from their homes who were Christians and I used to do everything I could beating them, torturing them, frightening them, to get them to blaspheme the name of Jesus. Paul recognized that that was what he used to do, to get them to blaspheme the name of Jesus, to get them to deny him, to get them to turn away from him. Paul was trying to do this, and Paul's the one that's preaching to us here in Rome now about the dangers of blasphemy, but he knew how wicked it was to create a situation where someone's going to blaspheme God. And that's what, he was trying to do that so that they, they would know, oh, I can't have anything to do with him. I blasphemed Jesus. That's what Paul's effort was during those early years before he was saved. Turn to Jude. It's the last book of the Bible before the book of Revelation. There's no chapter because there's only one chapter, Jude. We're going to read verses 8 through 10. Because the word blaspheme is used three times in this section and it helps us to identify the meaning of the word. Jude 8 through 10. Jude verses 8 through 10. It's only one chapter. Now it's talking about false teachers those who claim to be teachers of the gospel and followers of Christ. And the entire letter of Jude is devoted to warning about false teachers. Um, in verse 4, you read this. Certain persons have crept in unnoticed to the church. Those who were long beforehand marked out for condemnation ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Turn the grace of God into something for personal gain. That's what they were doing. Turning the gospel into a means to amass wealth. That's what they were doing. Oh my goodness. There's so much of that going on. So much of that going on. So much of that going on. We could just stop right there and dwell on that the rest of the time. But now, these false teachers, if we go down to verse 8, in the same way these men, these false teachers he's warning about, also by dreaming, they defile the flesh, they reject authority, and they revile, my version says, angelic majesties. That's blaspheme. It's the same word. They revile, they blaspheme angelic majesties. They make light of these powerful, supernatural messengers of God. They mock them. They make light of them. They speak ill of them. They revile angelic majesties. Verse 9, but Michael, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, all right, better put on the brakes and just describe that, what's going on there. So, this is a real thing that happened. Back in the, uh, the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible, Moses can't go into the promised land, remember? Because he had done something that God said, okay, you just did that, you're not going to go in. I mean, they wandered in that desert for 40 years. They came out, he, you know, Moses... That was the longing of his heart to lead them into Palestine, to lead them into the promised land. God said, you, and you can write that down for a question tomorrow for Bible study if you want, but you cannot go in, Moses. So when they're on the east side of the Jordan River, before they begin to even think about crossing over, Moses is now 120 years old and it's time for him to go, to head on into glory. He's almost, he's going to be dead soon. And so he goes up onto a high mountain. God leads him up to a high mountain. And 
from there, Moses can see all of the promised land, can see that beautiful land, and the longing of his heart, and I, I kind of love the, I love this in, in, a, in, a, in a really powerful way. He's looking at the longing that he had had for 80 years to see these people, to see this people enter this land and for him to leave. He's looking at the longing of his heart, and as he's looking, God takes him home. The body of Moses stays there on the mountain, and God takes his spirit. Moses goes to be with God in heaven. And in reality, as Moses is gazing on the physical promised land, God really leads him into the ultimate promised land, doesn't he? Where his real longing is, where his real heart's desire is, and he doesn't even know it yet until he, until he arrives. So Moses' body is there on the mountain. And Satan shows up because he wants it. What do you think Moses, uh, Satan could do with the body of Moses? Oh my goodness, set up a temple, set up worship, set up a whole religion around that body. Are you kidding me? This was the most powerful man of God in the entire ancient world. He conquered the, the uh, sorcerers and magicians of Egypt. They had nothing. They had nothing. He could, he could get the entire world to worship, to turn their gaze away from Yahweh, to worship this body of Moses. And Michael, the archangel, stood there contending with this, the devil over that body. And Michael said, mm -mm -mm -mm, the Lord rebuke you. It says here, Michael did not dare, verse 9, bring against Satan a blasphemous judgment. That's the word railing judgment. He would not blaspheme Satan. He wouldn't dare. He just said, the Lord rebuke you. And that was enough to win that battle. Verse 10, but these men blaspheme or revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct like unreasoning animals. By these things they are destroyed. It reminds me of the friends you were talking about, Casey. Those who are addicted to anything but God. And it's those things that end up destroying them. So, blasphemy is to speak evil about things you don't understand. These false teachers, they did not understand the, the, the wonderful, supernatural power and position and authority of God's holy messengers, his angels. And they spoke blasphemy about them. And that's what these false teachers do. They speak evil about things they don't understand, much like gossip. It's like gossip, gossip on a cosmic level, isn't it? And then one more, Leviticus chapter 24. So this is the third book of the Bible in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 24, because we see uh, an incident where blasphemy is happening. And, and we get an idea of what the Hebrew word means. And we also get an idea of the, of the solemnity and the consequences of blasphemy. So the Israelites, they're wandering in the wilderness. They've got 40 years that they've got to wander. When they escaped Egypt after the 10 plagues and Pharaoh said, go, it wasn't just Israelites that went, but there was a lot of Egyptians that went with them and said, you guys are the people of God. We're going with you. This is a failed thing over here. So a lot of Israel, a lot of Egyptians went with them. So here in verse uh, 10, Now the son of an Israelite woman, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the sons of Israel, and the Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel struggled with each other in the camp. So they fought. They're fighting. So this half-Jew and this Jew, this son of an Egyptian, are fighting each other. And it says in verse 11, the son of the Israelite woman blasphemed the name, the name, that means Yahweh, and cursed. That was a death penalty. That was a, a, a death penalty offense in Israel. So they brought him to Moses, and then they give the name of his mother. They put him in custody so that the command of the Lord might be made clear. That's a death penalty, but let's double check. 
Verse 13, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring the one who is cursed outside the camp. Let all who heard him lay their hands on his head as a witness. And then let all the congregation stone him. You shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, If anyone curses his God, then he will bear his sin. Moreover, verse 16, The one who blasphemes the name of Yahweh will surely be put to death. All the congregation will certainly stone him. Whether he's an alien or a native, when he blasphemes the name, he shall be put to death. That word in Hebrew means to puncture or pierce or perforate, to put holes in something. It means to desecrate the name of God by belittling it. The name of God is bigger than all of the world, but I'm putting holes in it, and I'm, I'm shrinking it, I'm making it into nothing. I am desecrating his name. I am, I am bringing him down. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm yelling out curses to God, although he did in this, because that's another word. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm the kind of things we think of when we talk about blasphemy. It means to belittle God. It means to make light of God. So, in verse 24, in verse 23 of Romans chapter 5, when... God's people, when God's people break God's law, they treat God disgracefully. Romans, sorry, chapter 2, verse 23 and 24. Romans 2, 23 and 24. When God's people... who are boasting in the law, in the, the Word of God, and then breaking the commandments of the Word of God when their deeds don't line up with their words or their words don't line up with their deeds, they dishonor God. And when God is dishonored by God's people, the people who are not God's people are invited to blaspheme God. You made little of God? I'm going to have at it. I'm going to make little of God. When my words and my deeds don't meet, don't align, when the words that I know of Scripture, which are biblical, don't align with my deeds, which are not biblical, then my friends and my family will despise God. Then the people around me will despise God. Then the nations themselves will despise God. And we see that everywhere in our world today. Christianity, when you go to another nation, say, and you talk about Christianity in America, they think about these kind of people. They think about Joel Osteen. He comes to their mind. You can have your best life now and keep bringing that money in. They think of Kenneth Copeland. They think of Benny Hinn. All these preachers on TV asking for money creating false doctrine and false dogma and false hopes and false dreams so that people will send them money. And God is blasphemed among the nations because of this. And when God's people are silent and don't stand up to defend the name of God and the honor of God and the word of God, then God's name is blasphemed. Remember we talked about David last week, right? And what was that giant doing? 
He was blaspheming God. He was blaspheming the God of the Israelites because they were afraid to stand up for God. They were afraid to hold the ground. They were afraid they did not put their trust in God and he was blaspheming God and getting away with it. And then here comes this shepherd boy, this young teenager, and he steps up and he defends the name of God. And he holds true to the name of God. And he brings that giant down. And God is exalted among his people and God is exalted among the nations. And that's what we need to do. We need to defend the name of God. We need to exalt His name among the nations. And we need to bring down every idol that rises itself up against the name of God. It is so easy for us in this culture that we've lived in for all of these years and these decades and these centuries now in the West to make light of God and to feel like we are people of positions of prestige and power in society because of our Christianity because everybody's a Christian but guess what it's not that way anymore no God has peeled away all of the fluff around those who call themselves Christian he's peeling it all away and he's saying now who are my people? Who are going to stand for the truth? Who are going to stand and defend my name? Who are going to boldly declare it in the midst of persecution and trials and all the things that we know are coming? Who are my people? He's peeled away all the fluff, all the protection of the nations, the protection of our government even, is, is being peeled away. Well, it's gone. That's why we're meeting in a barn. <laughs> and he says, who are my people? Who are going to stand for my name? Who are going to defend my name? Who are going to defend my honor? Who are going to be my people who are called by my name? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the rain. Thank you for an opportunity to gather together again and study a word. And Lord, I pray, I pray that our deeds would line up with your word. I pray that, that when people see us, that you are honored. When they see us, that they actually exalt you and your name is lifted up. I pray that you would just give us the grace to be those kind of followers of you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.